We had a basketball game coming up on Saturday at Bud Walton at uh, the arena with no teams. I'm so used to them playing in uh, Fayetteville at Bud Walton. In fact, a doubleheader. And let's get into some of that right now with uh, with Bob Holt from the Arkansas Democrat Gazette. Appreciate you, Bob. How are you doing today? I'm doing good. Hope you guys are well. We're good. Um, I, I just want to talk a little bit about maybe the presser for, for uh, with Sam Pittman yesterday when he's looking back at the signing class and everything that it took and to go into it. I can't help but notice maybe more than half the questions and maybe more than half the conversation wasn't even about players that signed from high school. It was about transfer portal. And this just is such a dominant portion of putting together a roster and maybe even more so than when it first came around. I mean, did you did you pick up on that? It's almost like there are more questions dealing with com- players going and what you're looking for in the transfer portal than maybe even the incoming freshmen. Well, yeah, the portal's become a huge part of recruiting and, and football and basketball and I guess other sports as well, but certainly in those two marquee sports. And it's about, you know, who's leaving, which most of the time is guys who aren't playing much. That obviously there are exceptions. You know, Mike Woods last year after spring ball, that was a that was a big surprise, you know. And, and then Arkansas gets an OU receiver, so I guess he was the player being named later in that trade or something. <laughs> but um, yeah, you know, the portal, a lot of it has to do with your numbers, like who are you losing, so who can you add? And I think you've got to have, you know, you got to have a certain, you, the numbers have to add up in terms of the scholarship limits and guys count ahead to next year and things like that. And if certain guys leave, it, you, know, you feel like you're pretty good at this position, you know, you've got pretty good depth. And then if somebody leaves unexpectedly, um, you say, well, maybe we need to find somebody in the portal to help, um, you know, bolster that position or, well, we expect that these guys leave because they weren't playing much, if at all. And that's that's pretty much the case with most of these guys, although there are some exceptions. Um, but yeah, I mean, and that that portal swings both ways. You know, it's hard to add guys if you don't lose guys. And um, I don't know if anybody imagined it would become uh, as dominant as it is in in football and basketball. I mean, you're having literally thousands of kids, probably certainly hundreds. Um, maybe in the you know thousand plus in football with, with the bigger rosters and um, you, you know it, and, and, and like I said guys are leaving right right now you know the right for bowl games or if teams aren't in bowl games that right after the season ended and so it's it, it that definitely complicates things for coaches I would think when they're trying to figure out their their roster numbers. You know, and Coach Pittman used a word yesterday that we hear a lot thrown around, thrown around in this show. It's a double word about the kind of player movement, and it's free agency. You know, and he even referenced uh, the boosters for the University of Texas that are offering up $50,000 for scholarship linemen, but he, he didn't complain about it, you know, and that's kind of almost antithetical to at least what gets the headlines. I mean, you hear some of the things that – Dabo Swinney is talking about it's complaining it's pointing out something's wrong and not saying you know he's just saying oh we gotta I hate that this is the direction college football is going from what I hear from Sam Pittman like he might have opinions about NIL and about the transfer portal he doesn't complain about it I think he accepts these things as the current playing ground and just tries to figure out how to work with this yeah, I think it's it's an ever changing world, a quickly changing world, and if you don't adapt pretty quickly, you're gonna, you know, your your program is gonna be hurt by it. I also think, um, and I, you know, a lot of coaches have called this free agency, and and you know, I think it's pretty hi- hypocritical of, of coaches. I'm just speaking in general to to say, oh, gee, so and so is not hanging around for the bowl game or this and that. When we have, I think, nine or ten interim coaches in bowl games mm-hmm. because. Now, some of those coaches got fired, but a lot of them left for other jobs. Like you know, Brian Kelly, you know, leaves for leaves Notre Dame for LSU. I think OU and Oregon are playing in the Alamo Bowl, right? They both have interim coaches, you know, because Mario Cristobal went, went to Miami and and um, uh, Riley went went to um, USC. And so this is happening all over the country. And I think if you're a coach and you're, and you're getting on players for opting out of bowl games, you're being pretty hypocritical. Even if you're not a coach who's opting out of a bowl game, I'm just talking about your profession in general. And you have, you know, coordinators. Now, Dan Lanning's going to stay with Georgia through the playoffs, which is great for Georgia. But, um, you know, Mike Leach was, has been pretty outspoken, crit- critical of players opted out of bowl games, and I guess when he was at OU, he was the coordinator, and he left to take the Texas Tech job and wasn't with them for their bowl game. 
I also think it's basically recruiting suicide if you criticize players making money off NIL and players opting out because, um, you know, you're basically saying, okay, well, if you come here and have some, you have some great seasons, and then you're going to be, you know, you're going to be a pretty high draft pick, and you don't want to risk getting injured in a bowl game, which is, you know, a big deal, but maybe didn't for the national title, then I'm going to rip you. Well, who wants to go play for a coach like that? Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, so I think the coaches who say, hey, I like, I thought Sam said the perfect stuff about Traylon Burks. We appreciate what he did. Obviously, we're going to miss him, but you know, he had a decision to make, and we fully support him. And I think that's the way any coach. Uh, hopefully coaches feel that way, and if they don't feel that way, I think they're pretty stupid if they say otherwise. But I think Sam was sincere in that, and I think a lot of coaches are. And I think if you criticize players for the transfer portal, I mean, the, most of the time they're moving on for what they feel are better opportunities to play, and you can't really blame a guy for that. Now, there are exceptions to that, but I would say 98% of the guys who leave are looking for more playing time. Mm. And, and who can blame a kid for that, you know? And then if you're if you're adding players in the transfer portal, how can you criticize other players for leaving? Because one, you couldn't add those guys who you pre- who presumably you believe are competent going to play for you, else you wouldn't sign them or add them. And so you can't add them if other players who aren't playing don't leave. So you know you can't have it both ways. You can't say, well, I want to add guys I need through the transfer portal, but I can't believe all these kids are leaving. And oh, I you know I want to be able to, to jump to another job, but I don't want my players to be able to you know. Look, look out for their futures because how many of these coaches who leave do, you, do they say this is a great move for myself and my family blah 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 well that's what the players are basically saying they're they're banking on their future in the nfl to be able to make millions of dollars and they don't want to they don't want to jeopardize that by getting hurt in a bowl game well if you can't understand that then i i don't know what your deal is you know I'm 100% with you, Bob. It, it is quite hypocritical, and when you hear some of these coaches talk about it, it, you just have to sit back and laugh. Like, how do you not just see the hypocrisy right in front of your face? But before we get to basketball, with this recruit, recruiting class and with everybody going to be on camp, most of them going to be on campus here in, in less than a month, I think on paper most people think that the position that you improved at most was wide receiver, just the amount of stars, the amount of guys that you got. What other position do you think that they got better in the long term? Because obviously transfer portal is going to be huge when we're trying to you know, fix the short-term problems uh, at, at some positions, kind of just put a Band-Aid on and wait until you can develop the guys that you brought in this year and possibly some other guys last year. But where else did they get better? Was it the linebacker position where they signed three guys? Yeah, I think linebacker was big because we we know they're definitely going to lose uh, Grant Morgan, Hayden Henry, who are two of their top three linebackers. They could lose Bumper Pool, Bumper, who you know Sam Pittman and his staff are working hard to convince Bumper to come back. Bumper hasn't said what he's going to do. I guess he's going to wait till after the bowl game and maybe assess everything. But they're definitely losing two of their top three linebackers, maybe all three. So that yeah, that was a key position to add some some good young talent. They could have. You know, add, add something, uh, some, 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 another guy or two. Mm-hmm. And I think, you know, like two tight ends, you know, that's a position where they tried several different guys. I think Trey Knox is, is going to be a really good tight end. He's, I think he's a good tight end for him now, but I think he'll be a lot better next year when he's able to add some, some more weight and get some added strength. But I think he's made a pretty good transition there. And, and, and you hope that Hudson Henry will be healthy and have a good year next year. But, you know, you never have enough tight ends because a lot of times those guys play on special teams. You want to be able to run two tight end sets, you know, get get extra blocking mm-hmm. there, whatever the case may be. So I think they help themselves getting a couple tight ends, and they, you know, they, they look pretty good at offensive line with with Dalton Wagner and Ricky Stromberg both saying they're being back, going to come back. That's huge. So they should have four or five starters back. Losing Myron Cunningham, who came, you know, a super senior, as we like to say, use that COVID year, but they signed four. Offensive linemen, they're, they're pretty high on, and because you, you always got to reload at that mm. position and build depth. And you know, Sam Pittman, you know, great offensive line coach before he became a head coach, and he said all the guys they signed at Arkansas, he would offer when he was at Georgia. So um, you know, that, that's pretty high praise. So I think that was a, a big position for him too. I think linebacker, tight end, and, and offensive line are, are three that come to mind, along with receivers, as you mentioned. 
Mm-hmm. Bob, on to, on to the basketball, and it's kind of feels like it's been out of sight, out of mind for these last couple days because we haven't seen the Razorbacks play a basketball game since last Saturday. They're going to be a complete week until they play their next game this Saturday uh, in Little Rock. Back to the, uh, it, during that OU game, what was, if you could boil it down to one thing that, that went wrong or one thing that Arkansas just couldn't do right that led to that ultimate 22 loss, and then what are some of the points that have to be fixed before you enter SEC play here in the next week or two? Well, there were a lot of issues in that OU game, um, but I, I think, you know, what jumps to my mind is OU jumped out 13 and nothing. And Arkansas, even though they were in, in, in led by 15 points at three different junctures, Arkansas was able to make a run back, cut it to four, cut it to three, and then ultimately, the last time while you got up big, they they pulled away. But I think just digging a big hole. I mean, they've got to, and, and it happened at, at the start of each half. So they've got to come out better at the start. They've got to come out better at the start of the second half as well. And then, yeah, I'm sure you know the the coaches like <laughs> the full week of practice mm-hmm. to really get into these guys um and um you know eric talked about it they were going back in training camp mode and obviously they want to beat hofstra but he wasn't gonna and i don't think he's gonna kill them you know with a three-hour practice on you know on today or tomorrow or whatever have like a two-hour shoot around on mm-hmm. saturday but um you know he was saying this is about the long haul so they were gonna do a lot of hard work this week and you know, obviously, what you know, OU hit, I think it was 13, 23. That's been a problem for most of the season in a lot of games. So, and Hofstra averages just under 11 made three pointers a game. So, that's an area I'm sure they did a lot of work on. They've got to shore that up. They got out rebounded for the first time this year against OU. So, I don't think they want that to happen again. Just 10 assists compared to 14 turnovers is always bad when you have, you know, more turnovers and assists. We've got to clean up some ball handling, you know, just get more assists really because 10 is not very many. It shows they weren't, their ball moving wasn't that good. So, um, and they've you know, got to show up the three point defense, hit the boards better and, and then get better ball movement. I would say those are three key areas. Bob, I, I sense a ton of frustration from from Eric Musselman. I mean, this is the same coach that was wearing a an Oscar the Grouch shirt about no garbage after you win, you know, and he's trying <laughs> to point out, look, we were 9-0, and this is one loss. You try not to make too much of it, but still, I can't help but, but just, you know, watching the pressers, watching Muss, and just the way that he even exploded at the, near the end of that game, there's, there's something there where I mean, he talks about going back to training camp mentality. He put he had them put on the weighted vest in training camp after the first exhibition game. I think he's really frustrated with this team, and that didn't really show last year until you know, like that little bump in the road in January, and they they cleaned it up after that. I'm sensing a a, a fra- fairly frustrated coach. Well, you know, they just didn't lose to Oklahoma. They lost by 22, and you know, it was a, it was a three point game with with nine something left. I think 9:55 they cut it to three when when uh, Note hit three three uh, three free throws after he'd gotten fouled on the perimeter. But but yeah, you know, that was a really big game. It was on a big stage. Arkansas, brought, I think Arkansas, without question, had more fans there than Oklahoma did. It wasn't like 90 percent Arkansas, but I'd say it was. 65 percent Arkansas, just based on hog calls and Boomer Center calls before the game. Obviously, the, the, the OU fans got pretty loud late, but and you know, and Eric got the got the technicals, got the ejection. Just ironically, you know, last year they started nine zero and lost home to Missouri, and Eric got uh, ejected. And I'm sure that was frustration with the referees, but it was probably also frustration just with everything in general, you know. Mm-hmm. And yeah, right. I think he's probably trying to fire up his team too. Um, I know that not going to help him in that particular game that that game was over when he got the tees it wasn't like those tees hurt i mean it probably hurt the final margin but it didn't it wasn't like oh wow arkansas would have won if eric hadn't got those goes, no OU was up by 13 or 14 at that point and they were they were going to win um so um yeah i, I think because this team has talent you know and has experience not playing together but they have guys with a lot of college experience and scored a lot of points in college and got a lot of assists and things like that so yeah i think he's maybe frustrated especially maybe with the defense he said that was the worst individual defense they played in his three seasons here which encompasses you know i don't know close to 100 games or something maybe not that many maybe 80 something i'd have to add it up but um yeah so i think he was frustrated and he's you know, he's trying to get these guys' attention, you know, because uh, they, 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 they shouldn't get beat by 22 like that. 
Well, I guess we'll find out how they'll react uh, at the arena with no teams on Saturday. Hey, Bob, we're not on the air next Thursday, so have a very Merry Christmas. Looking forward to talking to you just uh, before the Outback Bowl. Thank you. Okay, you guys take care. Happy holidays. Bet Online has you covered for all the holiday season. More props, odds, and lines than ever before. Bet Online remains your number one spot for all sports action. Head to our new updated desktop or mobile website to sign up today and receive your 50% welcome bonus with the promo code BELIEVE to receive your bonus. That's B L E A V to receive your bonus. And it's not just football. Bet Online has pro and college hoops, NHL, boxing, UFC, even in your favorite Vegas casino games. Don't wait to take advantage of all these amazing offers available for the 2021 season. Bet online is the fastest and easiest way to bet on all your favorite sports.